Yes, we all know this is God's book. But you know, there's something else that people refer to as God's other book. Do you have any idea what that is? It's nature. And nature is something that's all around us, and there's all kinds of things in nature that we can learn about. And when you go outside, there's flowers and trees and rocks and all kinds of animals. And these are all things that God gave us and that we can learn about. And one of the most wonderful things that I ever saw or got to experience in nature was one day we took in a little cat that we knew she was going to have some babies. And so we wanted to keep her safe and we wanted to catch the babies and keep them safe and get them tame. And so we fixed our laundry room up and we put this little cat in there where she could have her babies. And I had taken her to the vet and the vet said, she's no more than a kitten herself. Don't be surprised if she doesn't know how to take care of babies. And I thought, oh great, I'm gonna be up every night with a little tiny baby bottle feeding babies because this cat doesn't know what to do with them. But we waited and a few days later, I got up one morning and went down and looked in the laundry room and there was this little mother cat with five tiny little babies. And I had never seen kitties that tiny. They were about as long as my finger and just a little bit bigger around. And they were so tiny and so cute. And the little mother cat, we had started calling her little baby mama because the vet said she was so young. And you know what? She knew exactly what to do. She was taking care of those little babies and it was so much fun to watch her take care of them because you know, God created the mama cats very special. Even though she was just a little kitten herself, God gave her the instinct to know what to do. And she was taking care of her babies and making sure they got enough food. And those little babies, they knew they needed to stay close to mama and get their food. And it was so funny, these little kittens that were only a few hours old, they were pushing and shoving. We even had a little cat fight going on and they were pushing and shoving and their little tiny claws out pushing at each other and they were going meow 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 and push push but mama kitty she took care of each one of them and she would clean them and wash their little faces and make sure they were clean and they got enough food and as they started to grow and got a little bigger, they would start to walk around and they would fall over because their little tiny legs weren't very strong yet. And they would grow bigger and bigger and be able to get around better. And as they got older, we would let them have more of the rooms in the house to explore. We didn't make them stay just in the laundry room and the little baby kitties were curious and they'd go exploring. And you know what? One of the most wonderful things I got to experience in God's nature book was the mommy kitty teaching the kittens obedience. Because there was one kitty, we called her Penny, and she was always trying to go upstairs and she would climb upstairs and she'd look around and little baby mama 
She did not want the kittens going upstairs because that's where our older boy cats were. And she didn't want the baby kittens near the boy cats. And one day, little Penny got all the way upstairs, and she was looking around, and little baby mama went up there, and she grabbed hold of the back of the neck of little Penny, and she went dragging that little kitten back downstairs and got her into the living room. And you know what she did? She was going, meow, 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 meow. And it was just like when little boys and girls and older boys and girls and even adults do something they shouldn't. And somebody says, I have told you and told you that is not safe. You do not go upstairs where those other cats are. And it's like even little baby kitties have to learn to obey which is something that's not always so easy for little boys and girls and even adults to obey the rules. And watching these little kittens grow up was such a wonderful thing to see in God's nature. And this summer, as you're outside more and you can be in nature, you can look around and see some more of the things that God has given us to learn about. Beautiful to hear a child sing a song like that, isn't it? I couldn't help but uh, appreciate Giselle singing, You Are My Strength When I Am Weak. You know, it's got to take quite a bit for a child to grow weak. <laughs> They're so filled with energy, but thank you, Giselle. Thank you so much for sharing that. <coughs> well, in your uh, bulletins, you can pull out my sermon notes uh, for this week, and we've got our kids' quiz and things in there. Well, wait a minute. Did you not get one? Oh, maybe that's because I didn't make them this week. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, at least we'll have my PowerPoint, and if the guys downstairs would go ahead and help me get my PowerPoint up. Oh, wait, I didn't make one of those either. <laughs> well, let me get my sermon out. Hopefully, I at least took care of that. Have you ever had weeks like that, though? You just wish you had one more day, just one more day. But you know what would happen, of course. You would fill up that day with things as well, and you'd need even more. I think the Lord did a good thing to make it uh, a seven-day week or else we... You know, the French actually tried to make a 10-day week. You know that? They tried to make it... Three weeks in a month, each 10 days, and they failed miserably. <laughs> Nobody wanted to work eight days in a row and then have a, a two-day weekend, and uh, it didn't work out. I think God had, the, uh, had it right the first time. Well, uh, I do, though, have uh, my traditional little trivia before my sermon that I'd like to invite the kids to participate in, and so uh, I just have a few questions the, from the Bible, and it relates to the message. If you would like to participate, just raise your hand, and I'd love to have you join in the, in the sermon, okay? I'm just looking around to make sure I have an idea of where the young people are. All right, this is a tough one, the first one. What is the golden rule? If that were true, Howard... <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not everyone heard that. <laughs> Any of you kids want to? It's in Matthew seven twelve, or the traditional reading is. All right, Peyton. That's right, yeah. That was the more uh, accurate uh, translation, Howard. Treat others as you would like them to treat you. You know that one, don't you? The golden rule. It's a good one to commit to memory. All right, the next one is a, a kind of a fill in the blank. I need you to tell me what word is missing here. It's from Romans 13, 8. And the Apostle Paul writes, Owe nothing to anyone except this, 
to one another, for he who does this for his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Emma? <laughs> Grandma's looking it up and she goes, just one minute. <laughs> oh, nothing to anyone except Romans 13, 8. All right, Giselle. Love. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. I'll still get you, Emma, okay? I promise. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll be able to get this next one. What's the fifth commandment? I'll give you a hint. It comes right after the fourth. All right, I haven't had let Caleb answer yet, so I'm going to go with Caleb. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord thy God is giving you. Very good. Oh. <laughs> okay, uh, number four. There's still some chances here, Emma. Jesus chose 12 individuals to be his close friends and students. He wanted to teach them about God and holiness. What do we call these 12 men that Jesus called to his side? Okay, Emma, the disciples or sometimes the apostles, you are absolutely right. Very good. All right, last one. When Jesus went back to heaven, he promised he would send another comforter, which is very interesting language in John 14 and verse 16. He says he would send another comforter. Who was this comforter? Kennedy? <laughs> That's right. I heard you. Did everyone hear her? She said the Holy Spirit. Do you think she was right? Hey, guys, thank you so much. I sure appreciate you participating. And if I missed anyone, I, I apologize on the lower level. Um, I love to include the kids and to get us started with hearing their voices. Would you pray with me? God, it is now your voice we wish to hear, not mine. We turn to your scriptures and to this time of worship, Lord, seeking your blessing. Father, I pray that all distractions and obstructions would be removed and that we would know that we had been in your presence today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, happy Memorial Weekend. It's so good to see you. I see we're a little heavy on the lens side this week. Got more lenses in the congregation than we normally allow, but we'll just uh, wink at that for a while. I want to welcome you uh, myself uh, as the pastor of the church here, for anyone I've not had a chance to greet, and I uh, just want to say welcome to John and Rochelle Stanton from the conference office. So glad you've joined us. I don't know if I've ever preached in front of you before, John. I'm kind of nervous. John's a great preacher. And Rochelle is the assistant superintendent uh, for uh, education at Upper Columbia Conference, and John is our director for personal ministries. Did I get that right? So I'm very glad that they are, are here to worship with us. Well, turn in your Bibles to John 16. That's where I'm going to begin this morning uh, as we start with uh, the Word of God. John 16, and beginning in verse 5. I don't know what we would do without the Gospel of John, friends. What a, what a blessing we have. John has such a unique perspective on Christ and, and his personality and ministry and a, a particular focus on the Holy Spirit as well. John chapter 16 and verse 5. I'm going to be reading uh, about 10 verses or so here. Uh, to Are we back on? What are you doing to me here, Robert? John 16 and verse 5. Jesus says, now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. He's emphasizing this next statement. He's making it emphatic. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. 
to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, or your Bible might say comforter, advocate, counselor, very good. In Greek, it's just simply the word paraclete, one called to one side. My Bible says the helper. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. And I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative or authority or on his own, your Bible might say, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And when he discloses to you what is to come, um, and, and he will disclose to you what is to come, he will glorify me, verse 14 says. He will glorify Christ, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Well, if you have been uh, to this church recently and been hearing the topics and the focus of my sermons, you're probably aware that I have been focusing on the unique person and holy nature of God. Particularly, I've been trying to reinforce the truth of the mystery of the triune Godhead, that is, that God reveals Himself in Scripture as one God in three co-eternal persons Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Might not be a topic you dwell on at length from time to time in your Christian devotions. This truth is mysterious and strange to our human minds, and yet as children of faith, we accept our limitations in defining immortal God, and we take the Scriptures in their natural setting and meaning without trying to twist them to our own liking. That's our goal, at least. Now, those familiar with Christian history and church development know that this topic in particular has not settled well uh, over the centuries with the Christian church. It's a sad part of the record of history that that wars have actually been fought between Christian nations over the question of the nature of God. Christians have killed one another because they differed on what God's exact nature was. And I don't think this brought... God any comfort or glory, do you? The Adventist church, too, has not been immune to this. At times, we have found cause to debate and ponder the issue. Our historical development among most of the Christian denominations, our development is fairly unique. When our founders gathered together out of their uh, uh, experience with the Second Great Awakening, awakening and the great disappointment, they made it their priority to begin at ground zero when formulating their faith. Although they were impacted by their worldviews and their presuppositions that they could not escape, they wanted to come to the Scriptures with a blank page. They wanted to come and let the Bible and the Bible only tell them what their faith would be about. They were truly Protestant in that nature, the Bible and the Bible only. And because of this, some of our doctrines developed slowly. Some of our doctrines were uh, not as prominent as others as our uh, original founders began to gather. Yet, as early as 1858, Ellen White had published her affirmations of the three uh, three persons of the Godhead, but not all Adventists were in agreement. And this was not a major focus of their developing faith. That wasn't what drove them to organize and what drove them to be Seventh-day Adventists but they were studying. But by the 1890s, virtually every major leader in our Adventist faith had accepted the Trinity teaching as we present it still today. Desire of Ages, published in 1898, contains dozens of statements affirming the personality of the Holy Spirit, the underived eternal nature of the Son of, of God, Jesus Christ, and the unique communion of the three persons of the Godhead. Now, one would think that such statements like this and the, 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 the uh, founding of the church and the, uh, the clarity of the descriptions here would settle the issue. But as you know in Christianity, really nothing is ever totally settled. 
Even today, some are still questioning or even outright rejecting the biblical teaching, often giving ear to cynical or even conspiratorial voices of whose agendas are not always clear or wholesome. Now, the title of my sermon uh, this morning might be familiar to some of you here today. It comes from a statement from Mrs. White in 1906 in one of the periodicals, Bible Training School. It's a definitive statement, though, and I would like to share with you the fuller quote. I love that she uses the phrase trio, too, because it brings to my mind music when you think of a trio, doesn't it? You think of a trio, a quartet, and the, the heavenly trio being those three that come together in perfect harmony. And I'll mention in a minute why she doesn't use the word Trinity. The quote goes like this. You may be familiar with it if you've been in in this debate at all. She says, The Father cannot be described by the things of earth. The Father is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and is invisible to mortal sight. The Son is all the fullness of the Godhead manifested. The Word of God declares Him to be the express image of His person. God so loved the world, she quotes from John 3.16, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here is shown the personality of the Father. But then she goes on to say about the Spirit, the Comforter that Christ promised to send after He ascended into heaven is the Spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead. In all three cases, she refers to them as all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as a personal Savior. There are three living persons in the heavenly trio, and there's that phrase. There are three living persons in the heavenly trio. In the name of these three powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Now, early Adventists avoided the term Trinity. They did not like to use that, and the reason for that is very simple, in that in the the major Protestant denominations of the period, when they used the word Trinity, they meant it in a very particular case of God who is so united, so one, that He eliminated the distinctive persons of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In their mind, and in that period, when you said the word Trinity, that God is Trinity, Trinity, it meant that the Father is the Son, and the Son is the Spirit, and there is no distinction between them. Now, the difference might be subtle to you, but it was enough that our early founders said, that is not what we mean and want to refer to when we talk about the Godhead. We see a distinctive nature and difference. The Father is God, is like the, the, or the Son is like the Father. He is equal to the Father, but the Son is not the Father. There is a distinction. There is a characteristic that is similar, but there is a distinction. Subtle and yet significant enough that they did not want to get caught up in that Confusion. Now, I will share with you, most Protestant denominations have amended their definitions of the Trinity, and most of them come closer to what we would share as a commonality. Three co-eternal persons, distinct and yet uniquely still God, equal. The study of God's person and His nature is sacred, and it's a humbling endeavor. It requires supreme reverence, sublime faith in God and His revealed revealed Word. We must accept that the human mind is vastly limited in defining and comprehending the depth and beauty of the nature of God. And that was mostly my topic a few weeks ago that I'm just re-emphasizing. Exodus 15, 11, Moses cries out during the Exodus experience, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness. There's nothing to compare you to. Awesome in praises, working wonders. Secondly, it is a worthy study, enlightening the mind, expanding one's understanding. It brings comfort and solace, courage to souls, longing for divine hope and security. To know God is the highest form of love and worship. To know God. Obedience flows out of knowledge, but knowing God is supreme. It is a journey God invites us on and graciously guides the honest seeker. And that was a summary more or less of last week. Today, I wish to present a singular and yet I believe outstanding lesson that we learn from the Trinity doctrine and one that illustrates a deep and abiding truth for all God's children. And I can say it probably simply this way. In the Trinity, the holy community of God is 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we see the perfect harmony and unity that God desires for us. Three co-eternal persons so bound together in love and trust and unity that it is without contradiction to call them one and indivisible. Come back with me to John 16, if you will. The opening passage that I read, and we're going to focus mostly here for a moment just on verse 7. I emphasized it slightly as we were reading it in the beginning. Are you still there in John 16? All right. Verse 7. And I must, co- I must confess to you, I-, I love statements in the Bible that don't make sense because it piques my interest. And at first glance, this is one of those passages. And it has been noted uh, by, by Bible students for a long time. Listen to what Jesus says. He's trying to comfort his disciples. He's outlined to them uh, his coming crucifixion and ascension to heaven. He's been trying to tell them, I'm leaving Uh, And and he's trying to bring comfort to them. But look what he says in verse 7. I tell you the truth. And again, Christ used this as a way of saying, pay attention. Listen up. This is important. This is something that you need to recognize and understand. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage or for your good or profitable or expedient, depending on how your Bible translates, translates. It's to your advantage that I leave you. It's good. It's profitable. You want this to happen. If you understood it, you would say, Lord, can we speed this up? Get out of here. It's to your advantage that I go. For if I do not go away, the helper. And again, earlier in John 14, he called him another helper. Well, if the Holy Spirit's another helper, who's the first helper? Jesus, in in 1 John, Jesus himself is given the same term, the paraclete, the advocate. Jesus himself is a comforter. Jesus himself is an advocate. Jesus himself is a helper. But here he says, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The old, uh, 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 an English churchman and poet, uh, John Keeble, wrote this. My Savior, can it ever be? that I should gain by losing thee? How could it be possibly good for Christ to leave us? What could be the possible benefit to our spiritual experience without Christ? Isn't the focus of the Christian walk, the focus of the Christian journey, to become like Christ and to draw near to Christ and to have Christ with us and around us and in us? So how do we understand this, this, these words of Jesus? I tell you the truth. It's going to be good for you. Well, it might be very apparent to you. You, you probably are, are, are well able to, to navigate the nuances of this verse as Jesus shares it with his grieving and, and heartbroken disciples. Matthew Henry uh, d- developed six reasons why this would be an advantage, but I'm just going to share three very briefly. And I, I'll, sh- I'll tell you, these are not easy. They're complicated, but I think they're true nonetheless. First of all, why isn't it an advantage for Jesus to come or for Jesus to go? Well, here, first, I would suggest to you that due to his incarnation as a man, Jesus surrendered his omnipresence. Even the eternally living, resurrected Christ was unable to be everywhere at once and abiding in the hearts and minds of all the people. Through the Spirit, the Son is made manifest to all. Now that can be a challenge in understanding the incarnation and the nature of Christ, I just suggest it to you, 1 John 3, 24, John writes, we know by this that Christ abides in us. We know by this that Christ is in us, by the Spirit whom He gave us. It is through the ministration of the Holy Spirit that the personality and the nature and character of Christ is made manifest to us. 
That's one suggestion you can chew on. Secondly, and again, unique in many ways to us as the Seventh-day Adventist believers, the great plan of salvation would continue in heaven through the ministry of Christ. Paul had written that without Christ being raised, we are still in our sins. The work of Christ goes on beyond the cross. Are you with me? He would need to continue his work of intercession in heaven on our behalf. His pure sacrifice and ministration in the heavenly temple would begin upon his ascension into heaven. It is to our advantage to know that Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. So Jesus says it's to your advantage that a guy go away because I'm going to be interceding for you. Hebrews 8. Verses 1 and 2, we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man, is what the Bible teaches. But lastly, and this is uh, the point that really I'm wanting to emphasize this morning, why was it an advantage to us to have Christ leave and the Holy Spirit come? Why would Christ emphasize the superiority of the presence of the Spirit over the presence of the Son? I think Christ is illustrating a divine principle that among the three persons of the Godhead, they each truly seek to glorify and uplift the others and not themselves. Think about it for a moment. In other words, Christ was teaching that the presence of the Spirit would be superior to His own because just as the Son seeks to glorify the Father, so also does He seek to glorify the Spirit. The, part, the role of Jesus Christ in coming to this earth, among many other things, was to bring us the reality of the love of the Father, wasn't it? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When He taught us to pray, He said, don't, don't pray our Jesus Christ who is on earth. He said, you are to pray our Father. He, draw, he drew all the attention to the, the Father. Don't focus on me. Focus on the Father. When you pray, our Father who is in heaven, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. All of the emphasis is on the Father. And then the end of the prayer, it again places the emphasis on the Father. For thine, I memorized it in the King James, friends, I'm sorry. For thine is the kingdom, thine is the power, and thine is the glory. Jesus sought to glorify the Father. He said, I do the works of the Father. That which I see the Father do, that I do. He did not come to glorify himself. And the same comes with the Spirit. I just spit, excuse me. You know, the Spirit, you get the spittle. I came, he says, it's to your advantage that I go, because if I go, someone better than me is coming. It's the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit, as, as you read on there in John 16, then he goes on to, 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 uh, to illustrate how the Spirit himself does not seek to glorify himself. The Spirit will bring to us the words of Jesus Christ. It brings to us the message of the Father. He will not speak on his own initiative. He is in total submission and, and in, in harmony with the Father and the Son. And then the Father himself. When he speaks from the mountain, he says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him, and I have sent my son, and I have sent the Spirit to work out your redemption. You see, the, in their holy communion and unity, what makes the Trinity truly God and eternally inseparable is that they offer supreme and ultimate deference, respect, and honor to one another and do not lord over each other or try to assert their own supremacy. Does that make sense? Put it another way, each person seeks to glorify and uplift the other, which I believe is a lesson in Christian unity and Christian submission and grace. Speaking to the disciples, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, I want you to see it in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28. And I want you to think about this passage in the context of what I've been sharing. 
Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. Think of it in the context of the perfect unity and harmony of the three persons of the Godhead as Jesus shares this principle with his disciples. Jesus called, him, th- called them to himself and said this, Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 25. Jesus called them to himself, his disciples, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. This is how the world works. This is how the Gentiles work. This is how the world works. They lord over them. They, their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. Verse 26. It's not this way among my people. Nor is it this way among my trinity to lord it over and to exercise dominance or authority. It is not this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great must be a servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In that passage, I just see a a, a lesson there and an illustration of the plan of God of how we are to be organized and how we are to relate to one another and how we are to be humble and selfless and submissive and gentle and generous and kind. Jesus would only draw attention to himself in relation to his mission sent by the Father. Jesus does say, come unto me and I will give you rest. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Sure, he came as our ransom, as our Savior, and he needs to be, needs to be recognized as that. But he also said that I do that which I see the Father do. In John eight fifty four, Jesus said, if I glorify myself, John 8, 54, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. Nothing. I would say the same thing is true to us today. If you seek to glorify yourself, if you seek to raise yourself above others, your glory is worthless. It is of no avail. Jesus continues, it is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. Hebrews 5.5, 5, so also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. It was the Father who glorified the Son. Out of his love for us, the Father sends us Jesus. He sends us, the Holy Spirit, he glorifies them both to be his representatives and ambassadors. And in this holy relationship between all of the three distinct persons constantly working for the, uh, for the glory and the respect and the honor of the other, we see a community that is perfectly harmoniously united and beautiful. And ever since sin, that has been lost among us. Ever since rebellion, we have been struggling for supremacy over each other. Oh, you may not do it consciously. You may not do it maliciously. But the flesh, the flesh will still drive us to assert our rights, our privileges over others. In this Godhead that we worship is a perfect circle of selflessness, generosity, love, respect, devotion. This is the key of their unity, their power, their nature. This is what binds them together. This is what God desires for all his creation. This is the calling of those in the church. This is the challenge to those who claim to be his followers. The exact opposite of this is what the Bible calls sin. Iniquity, that which separates, divides, causes distrust. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference 
to one another in honor. Now there's a marginal uh, translation of that, that phrase, give preference to one another. In the margin, the other way you could translate that is outdo one another in showing honor. Isn't that kind of a, an interesting thing? I can be better at being humble than you can. Oh, no, you can't. I'm going to be much more humble than you. Oh, I'll show you. That's what it means, though. Outdo one another in showing honor. Give preference to one another. That's what the Bible teaches. And we you know what? When you're not doing that, it's called sin. You're familiar with the passage in Philippians. I, I put it here in my notes. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Paul writes this. Now, did Paul know what it was like to try to rule over people? Did Paul have an issue with trying to, uh, to persecute for a while before God got his heart? I, I just, I'd love to remind myself, every time I read the words of Paul in this context, this was a work of God in his heart. Because this does not come natural. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That's, that's quite a statement of unity in the church, isn't it? And then he says this in verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. That's exactly how the Bible describes the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each person regarding the other as more important than, their, than, than themselves. Jesus says, it will be great for you when the Spirit comes because I regard Him as being better than me. It was a perception. It was a statement of deference and respect it will be to your advantage because i regard him as supreme and superior there you have the secret of christian success regard one another as more important than yourselves easy isn't it oh easy not a problem i'll start today well, maybe not. Uh, tomorrow is looking good. But next week, I'll get to work on that. Paul continues, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself. He took the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You've read it before, haven't you? Even death on the cross. For this reason... God highly exalted him. This is one of the paradoxes that I love about uh, the Christian walk. If you want to be first, you got to be last. For this reason, God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus, most knees are going to bow. A few knees out there might one day bow. Every knee, every knee, all knees shall bow of those in heaven on earth and even those under the earth. One more statement that can be found in the spirit of prophecy. Quote, let us all, excuse me, let us allow God to control our minds. Let us not say or do anything that will turn a fellow being from the right way. Let us not say or do anything that will turn a fellow being from the right way. Lord, forgive me. I feel very sad as I think of how few there are who show that they have tasted the deep blessedness of communion with a risen, ascended Savior. Men of the world are striving for supremacy, he continues. 
God's followers are to keep Christ ever in view, inquiring at every step, is this the way of the Lord? Long before it was in vogue to say, what would Jesus do? It was right here. Let us inquire, is this the way of the Lord? A holy desire to live the life of Christ is to fill their hearts. In him dwells all the fullness of Godhead. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So what is your attitude toward others? Are you better? Do you judge people? Do you fight for supremacy? Who's in control of your mind? I'm in control of my mind. Oh, you're in trouble then, brother. We've got to relinquish ourselves to the influence of the Spirit. Who is in control, the flesh or the Spirit? How can we find success as Christians? The simple answer is to act like Christ. To act like Christ. To be like Christ who emptied himself Glorify God in all his words and actions and regarded others as more important than himself. We have to be careful because it could lead to a cross. It could lead to great sacrifice. But it also leads to heaven. The Trinity is a perfect example of holy submission, ultimate trust, uncompromising love, and absolute unity. Something that God extends to us if we will allow Him to control our minds. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, we bow our, our heads and our hearts, our minds in a, a humble manner, Father. We have looked into the scriptures and into history and in our own hearts to understand who you are and what you're trying to teach us. And Father, I just pray that we would learn from you. Your son came, Jesus Christ came to this earth to show us the way of life. He who was humble and gentle, meek and mild, kind and generous, was the pathway that he showed us. Lord, there's so much more that we can learn, but let us begin with these simple and yet profound truths. Within the fellowship of believers, Father, help us to also illustrate that principle of love and trust, of unity, of graciousness, seeking to regard others as your children as well. God, thank you for the journey. Thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the promises that we have in you. Bless us, Father, as we continue to worship you this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.